Who are centrists? What is centrism? Is this centrism? Is this? This? Or this? Of course the answer is, it's all centrism. That's always the answer. I think the best way to understand centrism is to look at both the perception of centrism held by those that defend it, centrist advocates, and what it actually amounts to in the real world. And also as well, the gulf between the two. Yeah, see what I did there? Look up centrism and you get quite a positive definition. Centrism is a political outlook or position that involves acceptance and or support of a balance of social equality and a degree of social hierarchy, while opposing political changes which would result in a significant shift of society strongly to either the left or the right. In politics, centrism refers to the tendency to avoid political extremes by taking an ideologically intermediate position. A centrist promotes moderate policies by finding a middle ground between the left and the right and downplays ideological appeals in favour of a pragmatic or catch-all party platform. Centrism can be seen as a means to maximise electoral support. We'll come back to that. Especially among swing voters, those who will vote across party lines. Okay, great. So, compromise of left and right, centrists are practical, apolitical, unideological. Which all sounds pretty great, if a little idealistic. The perception that's pushed on us, and that often we push on others, is that centrists push for moderate, often progressive, but most importantly moderate, reforms. And why is that good? Well, moderate reforms are sensible because you can't bring about radical change without alienating certain groups and certain interests. You have to bring everyone on board together slowly. Plus, the world is near perfect anyway, or at least the UK is or whatever's left of the UK when you're watching this vid. And so why would you need anything but moderate reforms? Look around, everything's pretty much a-okay. We just need a few tweaks here and there to keep things running smoothly. But when, I wonder, did the UK first hit this near perfection that we're living in now? Well, centrism, as we understand it here in the UK, is basically entirely encapsulated in Tony Blair's new Labour project of the early 90s which emerged as a response to the destruction of organised labour in the UK under Thatcher and the purging of the left within the Labour Party under Neil Kinnock. That was the moment when perfection was reached and only small changes would ever be needed. What centrist advocates of today fail to grasp, as does the encyclopaedia, is that the current political order, which came about through New Labour, was never a compromise between left and right, but in its very essence, fundamentally disagrees with the very basic ideas of left-wing politics. Because left-wing politics is rooted in grassroots engagement, collectivism, and organised labour, which the left argues is the only way to fight the powerful interests of capital. I.e., those with not much money have to band together and organise systems of resistance against those who have a lot of money and thus own all the factories, banks, and property and whatnot. Now, as a centrist, you don't have to buy into this left-wing mulch because you're not left-wing, right? But as a centrist, you surely have to compromise with it, right? If centrism is about compromising between left and right, you have to take on board the left's critique and left-wing programs. But centrist politicians and centrist advocates, if only on some unconscious bias level, actually believe that all this leftist thinking is dangerous and destabilizing. Because in actual fact, the interests of large multinationals and individual workers can work hand in hand, at least sometimes, in theory, maybe. And so the left, at best, is just disruptive to the process of real political problem solving, and at worst, makes industries uncompetitive and weakens the economy and makes things worse for everyone. The way you regulate the rich and the powerful, centrist advocates would tell you, is not through organised resistance but by outsourcing political power away from the dangerous mobs of working people and into the hands of competent, knowledgeable experts, or technocrats, you could say, who apparently have no vested interest, no skin in the game, aren't interested in making money, just want to see everything running smoothly. People like, for example, Keir Starmer and whatever team of Blairite advisors he happens to be working with at the time. These people, through representative democracy, are mandated with the task of monitoring, advising, and even moderately reforming the system 
to keep things running smoothly for everyone. Centrism, it's more like centralism, am I right? Sorry. And things like the financial crash or reckless corporations or incompetent and corrupt governments in bed with investment management and private contracting companies is just uh, a legislation error that can be tweaked out of existence if we just put more faith in the technocrats. However, one of the key problems with centrist thinking is that it doesn't embrace all expert opinion and then find the most practical, moderate, compromised positions. Centrist parties and programs reject any advice that challenges big money interests or challenges the government's want to avoid direct involvement in the financial sector, unless of course it's to give them no strings attached bailouts. The Labour Party must not need the unions and the unions must not need the Labour Party. And the evidence that having let the Labour Party uncouple itself almost entirely from left-wing mass participation has led to a creeping takeover of the levers of power by the powerful forces of capital is, well, quite a lot. Whether it's through the simple and fairly transparent funding of political parties by wealthy donors, or whether it's through lobbying parties or funding the creation of think tanks and running media corporations that then create the framework of talking points in the public conversation that dictates policy, or whether it's through actual business elites running for office. New Labour did indeed bring in moderate reforms, very slowly and much watered down over a number of parliamentary terms, they did do some quite good things. And boy oh boy has it been celebrated as great victories of centrism. But on the flip side, Labour also introduced some rushed through in the blink of an eye policies that weren't exactly what you'd call progressive or moderate. For example, the deregulation and then subsequent bailing out of the banks, the ripping up of workers' rights through creeping privatisation, corporate tax breaks, and the creation of a highly sophisticated and secretive tax haven network, all of which began or were actively built upon under Blair and Brown's leadership. Then there was Brown's autocratic signing of the Lisbon Treaty, and of course, the hugely unpopular military interventions, most damningly of course, in Iraq. Mr Blair, you are attacking Iraq with George Bush. How many innocent victims are you gonna kill and how many people? 500,000, next question. And then there's the rarely discussed sanctions on resource rich nations that operate outside the US monopolized global financial infrastructure. Not to mention the deep state surveillance, torture and other human rights violations that have accompanied these military campaigns. As Naomi Klein details in her book, Disaster Capitalism, throughout centrism's heyday, right-wing corporate interests were able to shift policy radically, not moderately, by jumping on the back of crises such as 9-11 or the financial crash, imposing the brutal forms of capitalism we live under today, by which I mean the privatization of, well, just about everything, and the destruction of anything that can't be privatized i.e. austerity and the airportization or pretification of public space. As Milton Friedman, one of the key architects of this political moment, and not by any definition a centrist, put it, only a crisis, actual or perceived, produces real change. When this crisis occurs, the actions that are taken depend on the ideas that are lying around. That, I believe, is our basic function, to develop alternatives to existing policies, to keep them alive and available until the politically impossible becomes the politically inevitable. And why were these the ideas of all the many, many ideas in the world that happened to be lying around when crisis struck? Well, because left-wing politics had been completely shut out of the formal political process. Let's ask Bill Gates about coronavirus. Let's ask Alan Sugar about economic recovery. Oh, shit. Let's ask Jeff Bezos about local investment or even space exploration. So what's going on here? Well, centrists, at least of the Labour flavour, argue that they have to move to the right in order to win elections, i.e. be popular with the electorate. And this takes us in to the most infuriating and confused aspect of the centrist argument. Centrist advocates defend moving to the right by saying that Labour can only bring about positive change by being in power. And they can only be in power by moving to where the electorate is, which is always on the right. And so it's never entirely clear if this rejection of the left and move to the right is a wholesale rejection of left-wing thinking or simply a pragmatic electoral strategy 
to win over the ever mythologized swing voters or Nunnetonians, if you will. On the one hand, centrism is argued as the best way to govern, keeping at bay as it does the angry mob justice of the left. However, whenever it's revealed that centrist policies are terrible and fail, instead of defending them, centrists shift gear and suddenly the argument is that centrism is simply a practical way to win power. Of course, new labor isn't perfect. Of course, centrism isn't the ideal way to govern. In fact, it's pretty terrible in many ways. And of course, in an ideal world, all of these centrist politicians would naturally be trying to create the socialist state of your lefty dreams. It's just they can't. Damn you, Nuneaton! However, the constant narrowing of the political conversation around right-wing talking points and the normalization of right-wing political positions delegitimizes Labour's own core values. It creates a kind of groupthink around which issues are important and what governments can realistically achieve. And it frames left-wing politics as either slash both unworkable and slash or detrimental. Your proposal for the Bank of England to print money to pay for schools or transport. In those circumstances, do you believe that the government would have to pay that money back to the Bank of England? Or do you think that this is free money? But there isn't a magic money tree that we can shake that suddenly provides for everything that people want. People are also sick of thinking that there is a magic money tree, so there isn't. Got to be really clear to people about that. 30th of March, the government awards a £133 million contract, unopposed in a closed process, to private healthcare company Randolph. 23rd of August, Serco receives a contract extension worth up to £410 million. If we are really going to be able to deliver the schools, the hospitals, the transport infrastructure, we've got to be credible enough to properly pay for it. We put £385 billion worth of money called quantitative easing into the banks to bail them out in 2008. And um, my suggestion is that some of that quantitative easing ought to be made available to fund a national investment bank so that we have a growing economy. We went into the last election promising cuts. We went into the 2010 election promising cuts. Are we going to go into a 2020 election saying, well, an incoming Labour government, the first thing we've got to do is make more cuts in order to make ourselves credible. I say invest to grow. Yes, you can't yes, cut yes, your way to you prosperity. Don't you grow your way. And this groupthink infects both major parties, and thus all political journalism around electoral politics, which naturally infects the thinking of the electorate itself. If both major parties are making the same talking points and agreeing that left-wing alternatives are unworkable, then more and more people begin to agree with this position, which in turn makes it all the more necessary to move to the right as left-wing politics becomes more and more unpopular. Somehow, centrists have convinced themselves that in order to bring about left-wing changes, they have to break apart and discredit left-wing organisations and arguments. Take nationalisation, for example. In the mid-20th century, this was an essential part of what was called the mixed economy. While competing businesses were seen as a great way to lower prices and improve efficiency and innovate, essential services, such as water or railways, were run by the state, as there is no natural competition and therefore no incentive to make the services any better. There was also no incentive to make the services successful or profitable because such services cannot be allowed to fail. Now, nationalisation of water and rail are seen as hard left proposals, unachievable and potentially dangerous for the economy. It is even now widely accepted that the NHS must rely on private outsourcing. It's also accepted that the NHS is a terrible service and could never be any better. And so here is the key line of this whole video. By selling itself to the right, centrism supports, if not entirely creates, the framing of politics that leads to the left's unpopularity. I wish I could find a way to phrase that more smoothly, but uh, if you have a better way of putting it, then why not write it in the comments? And if you agree, then give this video a like. Yeah. Hey, why not just give it a like anyway? An example of how all this works is the classic centrist dog whistle of labor needs to be pro-business or business friendly, or at least more business friendly. It needs to win back the trust of business, whatever. This is often said, not by Tory, but Labour politicians. Now, obviously this is a right-wing talking point, 
And if you actually follow the thread to its logical conclusion, you arrive at basically workers' rights and organizing, taxes and regulation are all bad for business. Better pay and better services are bad for business. In effect, everything that labor is about is bad for business. But what is good for business? I guess that must be the Tory model, which is the low pay, untaxed profit extracting Amazon model and the deregulated, reckless, crash prone financial market model, both of which are not particularly popular with the public, nor in fact good for many businesses. So why is Labour so eager to parrot this talking point? Why doesn't it instead point out that the pro-business frame of the Tories is really a pro-corporate frame and that what is actually good for business is decent services and infrastructure? Well, it's difficult for Labour to point that out because to do so would be to concede that centrism doesn't really work and that new Labour didn't really work. And as a result, it's actually not a particularly popular position anymore. And to do that would mean that Labour politicians would have to resort to championing left-wing policies. The organised left may well be ideologically wedded to certain political machinations, but centrists are equally ideologically divorced from such ideas. What you have to ask yourself is, are centrist politicians trumpeting right-wing talking points and bringing in right-wing policies in order to be popular, or are they championing these things in order to delegitimize and unpopularize any alternative? With centrism, what you end up with is a situation in which policy platforms that lead to widely unpopular results, such as growing inequality, a worsening of both job and housing, quality and security, and a deterioration of basic infrastructure and public spaces, is all somehow framed as the result of a necessary compromise by a left-wing party in order to remain popular. Though much of the left warned against New Labour, what's undeniable is that in the mid-90s, centrism did at least have some widespread support among the electorate. Or at the very least, there was an election-winning coalition that could be formed if you had blanket media support. A Tory-fatigued nation and a Tory party mired in corruption scandals with an uninspiring leader. And what was unknown and genuinely exciting to many Labour voters at the time was where this dynamic new project might go. But having ostracised the left before getting into power and then refusing to rebuild unions once in power, Blair's attempts to use private capital and market mechanisms as a way of financing what would otherwise be socialist programmes, but don't call them that, allowed corporate power to continue tightening its grip around government. And so, it's unsurprising to find that three terms of Blairism resulted in historically low election turnouts, as voters, trapped between the Tories and a hard place, simply walked away from parliamentary politics altogether. As Ed Miliband noted soon after becoming leader in 2015, five million votes were lost by Labour between 1997 and 2010, but four out of the five million didn't go to the Conservatives. One third went to Liberal Democrats, and most of the rest simply stopped voting. It wasn't, in the main, the most affluent professional voters that deserted Labour either. You really don't need to be a Benite to believe that this represents a crisis in working class representation for Labour and our electability. The only thing I disagree with Miliband on there is, you kinda do need to be a Benite to believe it, actually. New Labour apologists attempt to separate Iraq from the rest of Blair's time as leader, often referring to it as one of his mistakes. It was only an accidental invasion and occupation of an entire nation. But you can equally argue that Blair's willingness to enter Iraq came out of an exasperation with domestic issues. As it became increasingly apparent that his domestic policies were woefully inadequate, Blair turned to foreign intervention as a way of shifting New Labour's goals and goalposts and goalies. And so, in a decade that could have been spent preparing the nation and indeed the world for a green transition, fostering an awareness around climate change, was instead spent pouring vast amounts of resources into the war on terror. Everything from cold hard cash to policy to media debate were focused on what was at least in relative terms a pretty low threat to your average citizen. And in fact, the destabilizing of the Middle East and constant hype around jihadism in the end only fueled the problem. Unfortunately, whether we like it or not, this is a global movement. As I say, it's a bit like revolutionary communism. It's, it's not got a central command and control, but it's a loosely linked 
ideological global movement and it's going to take some time to defeat it. A lot of people say that we created the vacuum, the gap in Iraq that then Al-Qaeda said thank you very much and filled and hadn't filled before. Yeah, I know. And while the US and the UK attempted to police the world, they decidedly did not attempt to police their own financial sectors, leading to the financial crash of 2008, which arrived with exquisite narrative timing as a kind of denouement to the new Labour story. The crash simultaneously discredited the economic model promoted by New Labour and all but wiped out the moderate reforms it had introduced. And it was also not without a hint of poetic justice that Gordon Brown of all people, the man that had presided over the UK's treasury throughout Blair's time in office and had famously declared an end to boom and bust, just so happened to be the Prime Minister at the time of the crash and thus in charge of the biggest bailouts in history. Having spent the first decade of the 21st century concentrating resources on a war against an abstract concept, centrist governments around the world firstly allowed the financial sector to destroy itself and then unanimously promoted austerity programs that cut everything from environmental protections to forest management to flood prevention to pandemic preparation, as well as, of course, basic services such as the fire department and hospitals. Centrists argue that no one could have foreseen the crash, even if they hadn't spent the decade obsessing over Islam. But figures such as Jeremy Corbyn, for example, who just so happened to have been a leading figure in the anti-war campaign against Iraq, the biggest protest in the world ever, by the way, had warned of the risks of a deregulated market as far back as the early noughties. But Jeremy Corbyn is a hard-left extremist, and his views are all ideological nonsense, so it was only a spot of luck that his dogmatic bias happened to be correct in this one instance, or in both instances about the war and the economy. As the saying goes, even a stopped clock can be right about everything, all the time, 24 hours a day, if you stop the world from moving and decide history has ended. But even as the new Labour project faltered, and then began to lose popularity, and then began to lose elections, Centrists doubled down, doubled down, but with no ideas on how to solve the problems they'd created, all effort was put into attempts to suppress any alternative political or economic model. And so interwoven is centrism in our understanding of what politics should be, that many of us, talking about centrist advocates here, confuse its failings with a general failing of democracy itself. Which brings us to where we are today, with centrist advocates distrusting all political movements and all politicians, and expecting no solutions to any of the world's problems, and simply arguing for a slower decline being preferable to any alternative which they are convinced could only be worse. Centrists who constantly complain about echo chambers, in fact, live in the ultimate echo chamber, as the centrist echo chamber is still largely the mainstream consensus in both political parties. And while the left definitely has its own echo chamber to deal with, it is constantly informed and reshaped by the mainstream conversation. Centrists, on the other hand, have no escape. And though centrists can occasionally glimpse alternative views being expressed in, say, The Guardian, challenges to their worldview are invariably caveated as politicized, ideological, and partisan. Ultimately, they are always dismissible, like this video, for example. I'm sure you could come up with really good arguments against all the points I've made, but you don't have to. You can just dismiss them, because I'm a leftist. I'm biased. There's no point to even engaging with this video. 